Welcome, everyone. I wanted to wait until the music got to the crescendo and that there was a moment to interrupt that lovely music. Um, I just want to welcome everyone on behalf of the Romeo Bearden Foundation and board and staff um, and our co-director, Joanne Bryant-Reed, um, to wish you a very happy day. I'm glad that you have decided to spend your um, hour with us this evening. Uh, we have a very exciting um, conversation with Nanette Carter. And um, I just wanted to say a few words about um, Nanette and, um, and then we're gonna get right in it so that we have enough time. Um, many of you know the Romeo Bearden Foundation um, seeks to uh, support um, mid-career artists and all artists of all ages, really. Um, but this particular program, our Sing K Artist Program, is one in which we take the name of the historic gallery, the nonprofit Sin K, that was started by Romeo Bearden along with artist Norman Lewis and Ernest Critchlow. And the ideas behind that gallery was to support um, artists of color and curators of color and, um, and to give artists a platform in which to show their work. And so we take that on, not as a gallery, but as a program that supports what we do in terms of supporting Bearden's legacy. Um, and so we, the very special um, aspect of Nanette Carter's um, background is that she was a Sinke artist um, and she exhibited there at the gallery. She knew Roma Mir Bearden and, um, and it's just a pleasure to see how her career has just blossomed and she's just been a steady um, person on the scene. Um, and so I hope she'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, and then, you know, thank you all for, for being um, a part of our regular audience because I, I know that some of you, I noticed I'm recognizing names. So we'll get right in it, um, but we will take about 20 minutes to talk with Nanette and then we have a special film um, to show that's just going to be about four minutes and then we'll get into some live Q&A. So please hang out for that and please put your um, questions in the chat and, um, and so that we can see them. Okay, so um, Nanette Carter is a visual artist and educator. She taught at Pratt Institute of Art for 20 years and continues to lecture and lead workshops widely. She has enjoyed over 400 solo exhibitions. It's mu much more than that. Uh, what, what did I say, 445 solo exhibitions? Most recently, a 30-year survey at Nanamdi Center for Art in Detroit, Michigan. She's now represented by the Barry Campbell Gallery in Chelsea. She's exhibited all over the United States and as far away as Japan, Cuba, Italy, and Syria. Carter was a member of the famed gallery and you know she is um, she was very instrumental in a recent exhibition that was based on the Sinke Gallery at the Art Students League. So many of you might have caught that. It was in 2021 and they did a, a sort of short survey of artists that had exhibited there and Nanette did a lot of the programming. So um, maybe she can talk just briefly about that. Um, and so uh, then she's exhibited at the Newark Museum, the St. Louis Art Museum, and um, museum, Studio Museum in Harlem, Columbus Museum of Art. So, um, you know, she's in many collections, both public and private collections. And um, so without further ado, I just want to introduce Nanette, please join us. She's joining us from Berlin where she is in residency. So we're very happy that she could um, stay up with us um, at this hour and, um, and bring her presentation to us. So Nanette, tell us a little bit about yourself and your art and a um, little bit about that residency we see there. Um, we could talk about that later. We have a picture um, from the residency that we can show, um, but just tell us a little bit about your just history as an artist. Yeah, I've been making art since I was a wee little one. Uh, I used to, I, I love to say that my first studio was on my bed. I grew up in Montclair, New Jersey, and 
I had a stereo in my room and I just remember drawing and cutting and doing collaging even back in my uh, elementary school days and uh, getting so excited about making things, creating things. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, that ability to just kind of step outside of all that's going on around you. I'm in my space. It's the same way today. The space that I'm in here in Berlin is absolutely amazing. I've got great walls, as you can see. I've been here for two weeks. I started working already. Um, so it's, it's just, it's been my life and I've enjoyed it. It's what keeps me going. It's what keeps me alive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so it's always been sort of the storytelling around issues of the day. My father was in politics. Uh, I think that had a lot to do with it. And uh, so I like to, I'm actually challenged by coming up with these themes that then I'm working in an abstract genre uh, to deal with my themes, to, to talk about my themes. And this has been the case now for, for many years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always, in fact, this piece that you see now, this is one of the works from the series of Illumination, the first one, in fact. This was the series that I showed at Sinke in 1985. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, some of the same elements are happening as early as the 80s, where I have lots of texture, there's a sense of movement. Um, I think that these forms, I still are dealing with these very large forms in my work. Um, in this particular piece, I think there's a sense of movement, uh, maybe syncopation. And it was really a series based around my travels to uh, Rio de Janeiro mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and seeing the African retention there, which was just really quite illuminating mm -hmm. to see. And of course, the beauty of the landscape. You know, you have Sugarloaf Mountain, which is really almost a stone, a piece of stone, very textured, beautiful uh, beaches and gorgeous people. Music is everywhere. It's a festive feel. There's a real festive quality. Music is it's in the streets. Reminds me of Cuba in that way. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to have that kind of celebratory uh, activity and movement in, in the work. And the series was all, again, around my, my visit to uh, to South America. Have you always worked with um, sort of large geometric forms, abstraction, or did you come to that yeah. later? Geometric, but also primarily, I'd say biomorphic, almost sort of bulbous, cartoon-like kind of shapes. Um, but just shapes, yes. And sometimes they do take on a geometric form, but I'd say most of the time they're sort of biomorphic. And uh, I feel like every movement of the line, of the contour of the line is so important uh, in terms of the story that it's telling and what it's trying to, to put forth. And also just, I think it's also this idea of almost mimicking the body too, you know, especially the female body, which of course mm -hmm. has so many wonderful curves. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of blowing that up, blowing uh, actually I think stones, different things that we see in nature, Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the um, the material that you're using here, as opposed to your, some of your later work, um, you know, you're working with pastels, and it looks like you are, you know, um, shaving them off and sprinkling them, or or actually, them. How, how did you make that piece? <laughs> yeah. This this piece is actually oil pastel on yes museum board. But uh, the, the flavor, it's actually me listening to music too, and I'm always listening to jazz. So it's a, this sort of staccato-like pointillism, but then also some of it is sort of a mark that is a little longer than a point. Uh, and sort of, you know, sort of gradating that and, and playing around with that a bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what I'm working on now is mylar. And this is a really strong kind of plastic surface that architects have started to use actually since the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, it's slightly transparent. I use the frosted mylar, I use the frosted side to paint on, and I always use oil paint or oil stick. Such as and the what, works behind you, right? I just want to point that out, that those are all right. the mylar. What I like about using the mylar, though, Deirdre, is because it's so tough that it doesn't tear. It's not like paper. 
it doesn't tear, I can then put it directly on to the wall. Mm -hmm. So I'm no longer working with a stretched canvas, with the rectangle or the square. It really is about the shape. Of course, the earlier works like you just saw were all within, contained within a rectangle. I abandoned that totally and now I'm centering on the shape itself. And I like the way that it's on the wall and it just sort of floats. There's nothing that impedes. Again, there's no frame. I really like it that way. Of course, some of my buyers want to frame it, and that's okay. But the way that I like to show it is the way you're seeing it in the background. Here. Yeah, that's important that's to note. That's really important to note when you look at your work, when you look at images, say on your website or elsewhere, you see it within a frame and, and you might even assume that it has a frame, right? That it has an end to the paper. Um, but it's very important to know that these are shapes that you've developed um, and that you're playing with that negative space that goes in and out of it and around it. So it is important on how it's hung um, and how it interacts with the wall and the color of the wall, um, that's always important. Um, and I would also ask you to just talk a little bit about mylar, because I think for, for our audiences, they may not understand. It is paper, a kind of tough plastic paper, but how did you come to using that? I mean, how, did you just stumble on that? I mean, some people think of mylar as you know, just transparent or translucent uh, paper. Yeah. No. I'll tell you, I can tell you exactly what it was. It was 1984. I went to the Cooper Hewitt Museum. I happened to love Frank Lloyd Wright. And he was showing there along with his students from Taliesin, you know, his school that was in Arizona. And so I went to the show and I was going to see these drawings. And uh, I noticed that the surface and the way that the pencil, the lead pencil was reacting to the surface was very strange. It seemed to me as though the line had a buttery edge to it. It didn't have a hard edge. It was just soft and beautiful. And again, I called it black butter. Mm. Uh, and I, I was thrilled by it. I was like, oh my God, we're coming in close and seeing this. And then I noticed in the explanation that it said mylar. I had never heard of mylar. I could get mylar balloons or something, but not this kind of mylar. And I was so intrigued that I did something you're not supposed to do. I knocked on the curator's door. It, it said curator. <laughs> I'm a little colored girl knocking on the door. What is this mylar? You know? And a very kind woman came out and said, oh, yes, the architects have been using it since the 50s. They liked it because as opposed to tracing paper, when you take it out to a site and wind starts to whipping that stuff up and you're trying to look at your drawings and the overlays, you know, you're in a pickle. Whereas with this, it had weight to it. It couldn't tear. It was transparent. They could do their layers. And uh, it just, it worked out best for them. And Did so they began to even draw in the house, the drawings of the outer, the facade of the house was even used because I think they enjoyed working on this surface. It's, it's a smooth surface, even when you paint on it. It's just mm -hmm. this wonderful, smooth kind of quality that I just, that I love. I could see where that would be um, interesting also to paint on. So is it, does it give you a permanence um, or do you have to prepare the surface before you paint on it? No, I'm not putting any gesso or anything. I'm actually allowing, again, the frosted side has a bit of a tooth, mm -hmm. like you would have a tooth mm -hmm. in the paper. Yes. And that's what is trapping the paint mm -hmm. or the lead pencil or color pencil or whatever it is you're using. Mm -hmm. And again, these are all oil-based pigments. Right, right. And, oh, you know... Right. Talking about, right, talking about materials and, and traveling with them. You're in um, Berlin. Tell us a little bit about the residency you're in. Yeah, yeah. Nadal, can you blow that up? Because I want to show you exactly where I am right now. If you could blow that up. This is the residency. It is the Stiftung Starker Foundation in Berlin. 
-hmm. And it's absolutely amazing. It's a huge house. And I wanted to show you where I am. I'm actually on the, that's right, I'm on the balcony on the left side, this balcony on the second floor, that is where I am. And the window right next to the balcony is the room I'm in. There it is. Okay, so the, if you take a look at the balcony all the way to the left. Mm -hmm. And I'm in that window that's right next to the right of that balcony. That is my balcony. Wow. I can hang there. Yeah, it's really yeah. quite nice. And so there is this residency here. It's amazing. It's the Stiftung Starker Foundation. That's, this is their, their headquarters. But it's the Bar Organization. And Bar, B-A-A-R, stand for Berlin African American Residency. Oh, wow. So it's an organization called Bar that's run by a woman, African American woman, by the name of Jewel Stark. And she's been living in Berlin since 2013. And this is the first year of the residency. There's six of us here. Mm -hmm. Each one of us has an apartment with our own studio in the apartment. So my kitchen is that way, my bedroom is that way, my bathroom is that way. It's all right here. And I have my own entry to my, to my apartment. Wow. And uh, my wall that you're looking at here to my right, your left, is around 13 feet. Mm -hmm. Which is great because it really it mimics the wall that I have in my studio. The wall behind me is roughly 10 feet or so. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then I have some other walls on this side of the room also. And I work on walls. I work on my desk. I love to do things on the desk, mm -hmm. but I'm really putting things up quite a bit on the wall. I work on the floor, mm -hmm. depending on the size and scale of uh, the section of the collage that I'm working on. Sometimes I'll have to work on the floor. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll actually paint it on the wall also. So I, I'm moving all around. Yeah, and um, that that is a good question about how you actually work and whether you work on the wall because they look very sculptural. And I'm not surprised that you're inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright and architect. It has a real architectural feel to it. Um, you know, you've done some installations, right? You've done some site specific installations where you have to go in the space and actually, um, you know, fill it um, in a certain way. So um, that's a wonderful way to think about you working and you've worked quite large as well. So um, let's, exactly. let's talk about a few of those. Well, go ahead, what were you saying? Say the pieces behind me, these mm -hmm. one, two, three, and they're not all completed. And actually the two over here are finished. This one is not. They're going to be a part of my Afro Sentinel series. I see. And the Afro Sentinel series is really one where I'm talking about, this is my Afrofuturistic kind of stance. Okay. Uh -huh. These sentinels are to protect all black and brown people all around the globe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from injustices and, and social uh, political injustice. And they are quite formidable, mm -hmm. no matter what size they are, even if they're delicate, they can still fight for the cause. <laughs> right, right, right. And um, are you planning on a how long will you be in the residency and is there a show that results at the end? There is a show at the end and uh, I'll be here for a total of six weeks. I've been here already for two wow. weeks. Yeah. Fabulous. And so there will be a show at the end, but we are having a sort of a mini show this Saturday. We were to bring over two finished works. And so the show this Saturday will be those two finished works. Let me just say real quick, I really enjoy these residencies. I've been on a few. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I've had uh, the chance to, to travel to some absolutely amazing places. But with the Mylar, what I do is I will actually roll it up. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, when I have to return with the work, I engineer the pieces in such a way that they can be broken down and I can roll, even if they're huge and large, mm -hmm. I can still roll them up. And I actually take them under my armpit and walk onto the plane. With That's them. great. <laughs> 
That's wonderful. Right? That's people who are painting and have the stretchers and this and that. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. I can travel with these very easily. And so that works out great. Right. And so you, you have special adhesives that you use, I'm, I'm assuming? Uh, I do, because when you're gluing a large piece, you know, you're going to have it in sections, but there are going to be pieces that are going to be glued together, okay? If you use a liquid glue and you're working with a non-porous surface, that liquid glue in the center that you glue would not dry. I cannot use a liquid glue with these pieces. And when I put them on the wall, I can't use a liquid glue. Again, this is a non-porous surface. It's plastic. It's going nowhere. It is archival. And so I'm using a double-sided tape. It is archival, mm -hmm. and I only buy it from one place, and that's Talas, T-A-L-A-S, in New York City. It's now in Brooklyn. Yeah. It's one of our yeah. older art stores. Mm -hmm. And they have the three, it's a 3M tape, but it is the archival. Now you'll get it, you can see it at, you know, Michaels and Blix and everywhere else, but that's not necessarily archival. And I have been working with this tape now for, I'd say over 20 years, certainly. It does not yellow, it does not become brittle. Of course, that's why it is archival. Mm -hmm. And that's what's needed because again, these works, some of them are quite transparent. Some of them, because of the mylar and the way that I'm using them, the mylar mm -hmm. it is transparent. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm, again, I'm using the double-sided tape even to put it up on the wall. Wow. Okay. I would not have guessed that at all. That's so fascinating. Let's look at a couple of other works yes. and with that in mind. Um, I, I see this uh, next work is on stilts, what you call stilts. Um, and it looks like metal behind it, but it's just flat. It's just two dimensional. So um, yes, now I'm trying to imagine the tape behind even the very thin piece on top. Yeah, and I tell you, the gauge of the mylar that I'm using is not that thin. It, it has a nice gauge, a nice thickness, a nice gauge to it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. for in, in this particular piece, let me tell you, that's in two sections, okay? There's a top section there, and then there's a lower section. So again, I can break it down and have it travel kind of easily. But anyway, cantilever, again, an architectural term, Wanted to be an architect when I was mm -hmm. young. And uh, basically what it's saying is that we have a structure that is supported um, in one area, it's supported, and then the structure goes out. Cantilever is almost like what I'm doing right now. I'm the center and then my arms are going out. But if you can imagine, that's a building. Yes. Okay. And I'm the one, I, this is, my body is the part that's hitting the ground, and then my hands are going up, and everything else is going up on top of it. So that's cantilever, right. okay, so architectural term. So in this instance, we have three columns at the bottom that are holding up this entire structure, which again, looks quite heavy, and, uh, but it branches out both on the right side and the left side of those three columns. I'm calling those columns. And so that's cantilever. You're balancing on those three columns. And if you notice, those three columns go all the way up to the top as though structurally, they are what's holding this piece together. Mm -hmm. Now we'll see these columns and you'll see these very same ideas when you go underground in the New York subways, you will see I-beams. Mm, yes. Because of I-beams that architects are able to do cantilevered buildings. It's oh. because of these very strong beams that you can then have a cantilevered building and a structure that goes out with just this thin base or plinth that's holding everything up. And my whole feeling about this was I thought it was a wonderful metaphor for living in the 21st century. Right. Social media, you know, um, just the politics of the day, the, uh, the civility is, is gone, is lacking. 
pandemics. <laughs> what is being said that's true. It, it just so much stuff is going on in our lives. We had COVID, we've lived through COVID, we've lived through so much. And so I feel in many ways that's been our lives here, just this balancing act. Mm -hmm. Trying to do things together, trying to be somewhat in harmony and it gets to be very difficult. Uh, right, right. All together. But if we go to the next slide, I want you to see a piece where things are beginning to teeter. Ah. Things are beginning to rock a bit. And so although the bass, the plinth seems to be pretty sound, everything on top is kind of awry. Things are rocking a bit. Yes. So this is an instance where, again, and I'm sure we've all felt this at one time or another in the past 20 years, where you just feel like maybe some of this needs to fall off. Maybe I need to get rid of some of this stuff. Maybe, or just, you know, the balancing act has become very difficult. Uh, so I'm using, you know, this language of, of form and color and uh, texture, you know, to put across these themes and these ideas and, and right. to structure them in such a way that you get a sense of, of what I'm trying to say about living in these times. Right. And, and this is a way of you communicating this out, but is it also the way that it balances you as you work? I mean, I can see this work because you have to make these decisions about texture and heaviness and color and balance in the work. I mean, so that's a whole exercise. I that enjoy that. A I enjoy meditation. that challenge. And uh, let me say that with these larger pieces, the last one we saw, I'm sorry, I didn't say what it was. The last one we saw is 77 inches by 63 inches. This one is 30. This one, yes, this one is uh, 77 by 63. But this next one, going back, this is teetering. Okay, this one is 33 in height, 33 inches by 65 inches in width. Wow, that's so cool. So what I do normally is I will do a small contour drawing and my pad is probably about like nine by 12 inches. Okay, so I'll do a small drawing. And then I'll take paper, put it on my wall, the scale of the piece, and I will scale that small drawing to the actual size. So wow. I also have these big drawings, these big contour drawings. At this point, I'm not always thinking about color right away. I am so involved with the shapes mm -hmm. and how I want them to project. Right. And so I'm really keen again on that contour line, how things are moving. And then after that, then I'll begin to work with the color, with texture and making those kinds of decisions. Right, right, right. Can we see another work? Can we get the next slide? One, yeah. Oh yeah, this is one. I have to tell you, if we could show this one. Yeah. On yeah this, phone. this one I created when I was in a residency in Siena, Italy. So you have a bit of that sienna color ah, in some, yes. of, uh, some of the work there just a, a beautiful city beautiful town but in this one i think the forms take on even more of a sense of stones mm -hmm. yes and yeah. also i think this feeling of possibly that top stone finally teetering over and falling off and i wanted to project and give that sense of tension i love to give the feeling of tension in a work. And let me also say, and I know a lot of artists don't want to say this, I want my work to be beautiful. I want yes. it to be beautiful. <laughs> I want it to have tension. Yes. I, I, I feel in this piece, the, the plinth, what's holding all of this up is that bottom area that you see the stripes at the bottom. Yeah. And if you can imagine that stone that's right up above the stripe, it looks as though that stone is oh, just overweighing and just kind of mm. overwhelming that Plinth. And then, of course, as you go up further and further, you know, the weight of all of this, you can just imagine. Now, the height of this particular piece is 85 inches. Okay. And so the width is 62 inches. Right. And um, so you can see the some of the textures that are involved, um, which I truly enjoy. I'm dripping, I'm painting. 
I'm working with, uh, I'm actually doing some rubbing. I did, I had a wonderful old wall in Sienna that had great texture. And so I did some rubbings for this. However way that I can get my texture, I will get it. You know, and I've come up with some different ways of, of doing monotypes and coming up with some fascinating textures that I love to employ in the work also. Look at a few others, because we still want to play the film. So yeah. All right, real quick, this is a piece, and I'm sorry for the slide here, but uh, this is a piece that I did here. It's right behind me. I just wanted to see a close up. Yeah. Uh, this one is a part of the Afro Sentinels. You get a sense, I think, of possibly a shield, like an African shield, even in the shape of this. Um, yeah, and it's this one is the height of it is about 54 inches and the width is 13 inches. Yeah. Even though I see a lot of architecture in, in your work, so many of them feel very figurative. Like even the, the one that, the last one with the stones, it looked very sort of curvy, um, you know, and I think about figures um, when I, when I look at this one, even I yeah. think about, you know, a very upright, um, you know, sturdy, um, vertical figure. Yeah. And then let me say that the black, uh, vertical middle section actually goes down further. I just wanted to come in close just so that you could see mm -hmm. what's going on. But you can see in the back here, it actually, yes. that black area does extend down to the uh, again, 54 inch. Let's see the next one. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love this one too. Yeah, I do too. I like to work black and white. Mm -hmm. I will always do black and white pieces. You know, there's so many different types of blacks. There's so many different types of grays and whites, cool and warm blacks. Um, I just, I love working with all, all the different values. Mm -hmm. And uh, this piece is, is a gem, this one. This one is actually a smaller work. I have the measurements here. That th it's 13 inches by 15 inches. And okay. you'll see that I've placed it on a grid which of course architects will use also. Right. And, right. and I do like using the grid for the smaller pieces. I think it just accentuates that whole idea of this architectural feel right. um, and this idea of planning. And let me also say very quickly that with my large works, because I'm on a ladder, I'm on a floor, I, there's so much that's going on. It's no longer just a tabletop experience. I really feel as though I'm building. I don't think collage is really quite the word for these larger pieces. I feel like uh, I'm a builder. And it's uh -huh. also taking care of that need that I've had for years to do architecture. You know, so this is my way of building. Yeah. It's, it's the best way. This is, this is the best way for me, yeah. Great. Um, can we see the next slide? And while we, while we look at that, can you just say just a quick word on what it's like being an educator for all of these years and doing your own work and, you know, leading students um, through to their own visions? How does that work for you? You know, I think that I probably learned just as much from my students as they did from me. Mm -hmm. um, keeping up with young people, you know, keeping abreast as to what's going on is always kind of, I think it's important. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, I also enjoy the most, the one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. I'm not a lecturer, you know, I'm not doing an art history class. It's right. really about me coming right up to close, you know, and talking to someone about what are your, what's your vision? What do you want to say? What's going on? What's exciting you? What yeah. are the materials that you want to use? What, what's the best way to illuminate your narrative or your theme? Uh, that's what really kind of excites me. I can step outside of my own, you know, issues and things that are going on and see how other people are thinking and hopefully give them some tips and ideas as to how to proceed. Or as I tell, I will tell. Listen, you can take it or you can leave it. Don't worry. I'm just throwing some things out. But that certainly was one of the things I would say quite often. Sometimes young people get stuck, or they feel like 
you know, maybe they're not quite ready or what, so, you know, just giving them some ideas to move forward. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. again, I really like the one-on-one. -on -one. I am not a lecturer, you know, and I, I would do, I would always show slides. You know, we had classes that were six hours long. These are studio classes. Mm -hmm. So for one day you meet with a group for six hours and then you meet with that same group for the whole year. Yeah, wow. So I would show slides of other people who were drawing. I was teaching a drawing class. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone knows the painters and the sculptors, but a lot of folks don't really know some of the folks who really just centered around collage and drawing. That so is I would show, for one hour, I would show work, you know, and I would let them, I'm not an art historian, but I just yeah. think you need to see these pieces. Yes. See these artists. But yeah, I, I love the exchange. Yeah, yeah. And I bet a lot of them probably experiment with mylar now. You're like the queen of mylar. So <laughs> they can't help but you know, want to work with that material. I don't know anyone who's worked with it as long as I have, because I've been working with this now since 1996. I stopped working on canvas around 1996, 97. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so you do collage, you do installation. Um, and you told me that you filmed this video, this next video. So is that something we might see more of in the future? Video well, and installation? Here. Yeah, I was really, I've got, you know, it, it took me, I'll tell you, it took me two years to do this piece that we're about to see. But it was not only uh, me filming myself on my, you know, my phone, okay, but also my partner, uh, Kenneth Laidlow helped out. And then my IT person who worked with me quite closely was Yijin, uh, who actually did the editing. But um, I went to Garage on my, you know, Mac and did the music and the sound. And so I did all of it. I, I actually like that. And I like the quality that it seems homemade. I, I'm not so sure I'm gonna ever do any slick video really. It's gonna always be sort of homemade. But I do want to do more. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, let's show the film because it's short and it's short enough for, for us to enjoy it right here in this platform. So thank you so much. Um, and let's let's see that.
That's wonderful, Nanette. I love that. Um, and I really can imagine what a film animate, animating your pieces would be like. It would be really... Um, That's what I think I'm going to do. And you know, it's so interesting. At the beginning, when I do my hair and the first piece goes up, you know, they're caryatids. And this yes. is where you have the architecture where women are holding up the building. You've seen yes. these structures. This is classical, you know, Greek and Roman stuff. But these women would be holding up, they'd be the columns holding up. That's right. Well, carriages. And, and I thought of myself yeah. in that way also, you know, yes. holding yes. up this, this structure. Right, right. Well, that's wonderful. Well, I just want to thank you. Um, we're going to go to some questions, but I really want to thank you for sitting down and talking with me. I've always loved your work. I, we dragged a student over, a fellow over to your studio. Yeah. You're so open. And um, it was wonderful to really see, um, you know, so much of the work um, that you've done over the years. And you were preparing to go to Japan when we went there. And yeah. And that's the other thing is, you know, when you talk about bearing, you know, these, these works and ideas, um, you have been in the business for so very long. Um, so I want to thank you for just representing, representing Black women and representing people who work in two-dimensionality and, you know, abstraction, um, you know, because as we know with art, it goes in and out, uh, you know, the flavors of the day go in and out and you have been a steady constant um you know presence in in work so let me see i don't i don't want to give, leave some time for questions um i see one question in the q a um and this is from sarah drake uh she said she doesn't have a question i i know sarah she's a teaching artist but she said she wanted to thank you for your time and knowledge. Um, she's a collage artist and just this morning, she was wondering about trying a new material and what it would be. I can't wait to go and try Mylar, <laughs> an archival tape. So you've already helped an artist. Um, and then we have another question from our friend Ellie Tweedy, um, who wants you to talk a little bit more about Sinke, the Sinke Gallery. That is something that we, um, absolutely want you to um, talk a little bit about your experience in Senke. Yeah, and I do know Ellie. Hello, Ellie. Um, Senke, at the time that I had uh, sort of discovered the place, and I'm trying to recall, it may have been Bill Hudson, 
oh gosh, and Bill Hudson just passed. This mm -hmm. is a mm -hmm. fantastic, brilliant artist who was my mentor, one of my mentors. Um, he said, you know, go to St. K. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Tyrone Mitchell who's showing the sculpture there. And I recall going to see the show and it was just, it was fabulous. This is, you know, the early 80s. I had not seen other African Americans showing in New York. Um, I think Beard may have been the only one at the time. Uh, maybe Ed Clark at Randall Gallery. But, uh, you know, to see his sculpture there, it was lit just right. And I was so excited to see this space that was for emerging artists. Um, and then I recall going to several of the shows and of course it moved to 72nd Street. And I went to meet uh, Ruth Jett and would stop by there quite often. And Ruth was the one that, uh, and, and I think it was the artistic committee, who I believe at the time William T. Williams was there on the artistic committee, Al Loving. And uh, they asked me to, to exhibit there, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I had just uh, left a gallery myself. It was heartbreaking. It was an ugly situation. So I fell into the arms of Sinke and it was most welcoming and had a fabulous time and met other artists while I would go to the openings. That was the other thing, the gathering of artists, writers, um, you know, black thinkers, musicians were coming through to see the shows there. Uh, it was a wonderful place to network. Yeah, it was a real vibe. I mean, it was a real community space. Um, and um, and that's how artists can thrive. Um, yeah. They, yeah. yeah, and it was so popular. The word got out across the country because, you know, once I became a part of the artistic uh, committee, we had people cut giving us slides back then, it was slides, from all across the country, mm -hmm. trying to show in New York. This was the only way that, as an African-American, you could show in New York City at that time. You had a chance at Sinke. Yeah, yeah. And, who, and how did those shows come together? Did artists actually install the work themselves? No, many times the artistic committee, I know I installed a couple of shows mm -hmm. when I was on the artistic committee, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think Ruth Jed helped out sometimes. It was different people, you know, mm -hmm. whoever the curator might be, mm -hmm. would also, you know, install. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, well, I think it was a great community though, Ellie. It was, it was fabulous. And at, if you did go to see the show at the Art Students League, you'll see the list of names. It was, I think, well over 400 artists that showed there. You know, it right. wasn't a gallery that had a stable of artists. That wasn't the manifesto. That was not what it was about. It was really about bringing in as many artists as they could, because there was so, so much talent out there, as we know, there always has been. Mm -hmm. um, and it was languishing. People were still making art, but right. they were not exhibiting. They had no place to exhibit. Right, right, right. Um... Yeah, and I, I know that Beverly Buchanan exhibited there. Um, I think even um, Cole, what's his, what's his name? The um, artist Cole, we recently, I mean, um, Susan uh, Stedman, I think many of you might know her on this call, um, has been doing some research and that, um, and it was very, it was, she curated the exhibition um, at the Art Students League. And she's been in covering, yeah, she had that whole long list of artists who had exhibited there. I think it was some 300 plus artists. So um, that's a great history um, there. Uh, before we leave, I wanna make sure I get a couple of these more questions, uh, other questions. Um, one was about the influence of music in your work. And this comes from Chris Haney. Um, and any particular style um, is music. I, I'm listening primarily to jazz. Mm -hmm. I will listen to some R&B. In fact, I will stop and dance. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> While I'm working, I can, if the music is good, I'll get out and dance. Um, the work, I think, has a sense of rhythm and syncopation. I'm sure it's due to my jazz. Mm -hmm. 
And I will listen to some classical music. I like Bach in particular. Mm -hmm. um, but it's primarily jazz and R&B. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, I, like, I like Afrobeat too. I like the some African music, Baobab. Oh Afrobeat, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. oh, uh -huh. yeah. Oh, good. Okay. So I'm moving and grooving, and so of course some of the shapes are going to do the same thing. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm having fun. I enjoy myself. Right, right. Um, we have a number of people just saying bravo. Nanette, one's from um, Sydney Kai. Oh, Much respect. You got, you got some. You got a community on here. Of people saying hi. Um, but also, uh, let's see. I don't want to miss anything. We got a question here from our friend, Rich Blint. Um, <laughs> he says, brilliant exchange. I wonder if you could speak about the difference between making one's work beautiful rather than decorative. And could you speak about the relationship between movement and weight, especially in the last piece? Yeah. You know, decorative art can be beautiful too now. Mm -hmm. I don't have mm -hmm. any issues with decorative art. No, no. Um, you know, there's something about certain musicians, and I'm going to tell you, I think I gravitate to musicians that have this sense of mystery and almost magic. Mm -hmm. Thelonious Monk, Cecil Taylor, I mean, you know, um, Coltrane, just the spiritual quality of the music. And I think that I really want the work to have that flavor also, the flavor of, what should I say, you know, color, beauty, there's a harmony, but there's also a discord, and discord can also have a beautiful presentation to it, it can also be quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. Tension can be quite beautiful, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the strength of it. Um, and so the last piece that I showed, what was the last part of Richard's question? The last piece I think was destabilization, oh. destabilizing. If we could just show that. Um, That's the recent series. Yes, indeed. That's mm -hmm. a recent series. Um, you know, it's interesting, my work in the last 20 years has been dealing with this, this idea of balance and imbalance. And I feel that destabilizing really, oh my gosh, it really talks about just the mindset, sort of a collective consciousness right now. I think everybody is feeling destabilized. I, the question of democracy, you know, is this going to work? What is happening to our country? This idea of people shifting perspectives in one minute, you've got a two-term black president by the name of Barack Hussein Obama, and then what follows is a Donald Trump. You know, that's destabilizing. Mm -hmm. That's shifted, the country has shifted perspectives. I have another series I just started called Shifting Perspectives. So, I end up in many ways documenting, and I think all artists do this, documenting sort of the period that I live in. I can't help but deal with what I know and what I experience at the moment, mm -hmm. what's going on here. But I think that I can push this and say that it is a collective uh, situation. It's, I'm not alone in this. Mm -hmm. This is something that's being felt, I think, globally. Um, yeah. So this destabilizing, you know, again, it looks as though things could teeter off again. But, you know, you have these, I love stripes, first of all. Stripes that are, mm -hmm. you know, vertical, give the sense of strength. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be, you know, strong enough to hold up all of this craziness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And there's some craziness going around. I just want them to indict Donald Trump. <laughs> I want to see him put behind bars like you see in this piece. <laughs> okay. More. But yeah, I, you know, we don't need this. And he, he, he acts as though this is fun. This is a playground for him. 
No, these are people's lives. You know, and this idea of trying to separate people. I mean, they're poor white people and they're poor black folks. Why can't we come together and do something mm -hmm. for, for these for people, middle class and poor people? And come into some harmony. This is what you're talking about. The you yeah. know the balance and harmony yes. of different thoughts yeah. and different people, right? We're supposed to have that balance, isn't That's it? That's right. That's right. Um, I hate to stop this conversation because it's so good, and that's the, we we got to have you back again. <laughs> um, but I will say that uh, Mary Bullock, um, she she thanked you for the explanation of materials and inspiration, and this is really important because this is one of the things that we like to get at when we have these artist talks. This is sort of just an intimate talk about materials and inspiration. Um, and she said that, she said something very beautiful. She said, like your poetry, they reveal your inner state, something that's delicate in a strong manner. You use shapes to build an artwork the same way you use words to build a poem. All explorations of the tension that gives life its joy. I just wanted to read that, like, you know, like it's my closing statement. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. <laughs> thank you for reading it, and thank you, Mary. Yes. Oh, beautiful. Yes. Yes. And you have you have plenty of um, fans here, and you'll we'll save this so that you can read all of the good wishes. Oh, I would love to read. Yeah. Well, so, I just you. want I want to thank you for joining us. Um, and again, we probably could have a whole nother show with you when you get back <laughs> from your um, residency. Uh, and I want to thank Nadal, our producer, um, Nadal Canary. Thank you so much. And Harlem One Stop, UN Chang. We're doing wonderful things with the culture, the Harlem Cultural Collaborative. Um, and I want to thank our, our team in the background, um, Joanne Bryant-Reed and Ron Jackson, and all of you who have joined us this evening and who continue to come and check in on our programs. We really appreciate um, your support. Um, so thank you, Nanette, and um, good luck with the rest of your residency, and we hope to hear from you soon. Ciao. Thank you so much, Deirdre. All right. Thank you. Thank you.